The existence and uniqueness theorem applies to differential equations because that's what we're studying. And what it really is trying to tell you is that if you have a differential equation, the punchline is uh, that this theorem guarantees that that differential equation has a solution. And not only that it has a solution, that it has a unique solution. In other words, one solution. Um, if the um, certain constraints are met, and we'll talk about what they are. In other words, if the differential equation is well behaved, that's really what it is. If there's no crazy discontinuities, if there's no jumping around, weird looking functions, if it's a normal, smooth, nice differential equation that's well behaved, we'll talk about what that means, then it will have a solution going through that initial condition and it'll be a unique solution. That's all it's really telling you. And the reason it's an important theorem is because remember, we've solved some pretty relatively simple differential equations so far. But even in our very limited study of differential equations that we've done up till this point, some of the solution methods can get pretty, pretty involved. A lot of integration, a lot of going back, doing different things to even get to the solution. When you get to more and more complicated differential equations, um, the solution methods are actually going to get longer and lengthier. And when you get to a certain point, you just, nobody knows how to solve them. There's no way to write down a closed form solution, you know, x of t is equal to something. Um, so when you get to more and more complicated equations, it gets harder and harder to solve them. Just like integration, you might find an integral that you don't have a technique of integration for. You know that an integral exists, um, but you don't know what it is. And why is that? Because the theorems and calculus tell you for this function, every function we have in antiderivative. We call it an integral. It exists. So this is all the existence and uniqueness theorem is telling you. It's saying, look, if you have a differential equation, even if you have no idea how to solve it, people smarter than you and I have proven in the past that a solution exists and it's a unique solution provided that the differential equation is well behaved. So let's go ahead and write it down. That was the punchline. That's really what it is. That's what I want you to hold in your head as you're on your test or if you're asked to explain what the existence and uniqueness theorem is. What I'm going to do now is write it down so we can sort of dissect it so that when you read it in your book, it won't seem so foreign. All right, so what we have is, what we're talking about is the existence and uniqueness theorem. Okay, that's what we're talking about. And what it basically is saying is the following. So suppose, and this is one way of writing it. Your, your book may not formulate it in exactly the same way, but it is intending to convey the same result. So those, suppose a first order ordinary differential equation. And by the way, right now we're expressing it in terms of first order equations because that's what we've learned so far. Existence and uniqueness carries on into higher order equations also. Uh, suppose we have a first order equation uh, and it can be written let's say we can write it as the following thing. Let me switch colors because we're basically saying that we can write the differential equation like this. So dx dt plus some function of t times x is equal to some function of t. And basically all uh, differential equations that you're going to really study as far as first order ones that you can solve are always going to be able to be written like this. Um, you're going to have dx dt, you can put this in terms of some pure function of t. I call it p of t. It could be anything. Your book may express it a little bit different, but what it's trying to say is you have dx dt, you have x, and then in front of x you have some function of t. This could be, you know, sine of t. This could be t squared. This could be anything over here. And on the other side, same thing. Could be cosine of t. Could be logarithm of t. Some function of t. Could be t by itself. Could be just the number one over here because that's technically a function of time. Uh, and so on and so on. But in the general case, you should be able to divide everything out so your differential is, is over here by itself. Function of t times x is equal to a function of t. And really most of the equations, and in fact I would even go as far as to say all of the ones that we've really studied up to this point that we can solve, you can write them in that, in that form. So let's say we can write an equation in that form. Then the theorem states the following thing. Actually I'm going to even change colors to sort of write the conclusion. This is what the theorem is saying. Theorem says, there exists, notice the word exist, existence and uniqueness, there exists a solution 
through an initial point an initial point and I'm going to actually switch colors to write that x of t naught is equal to some number alpha I'm just going to call it alpha uh, so we have a solution through this point, we'll talk about it in a minute, if P of T and Q of T are continuous. At T naught, which is the point of my initial condition that I just wrote here. Okay, so that's really the punchline, but it goes on to say a little bit more. This solution... is unique and it exists at least on the largest on the largest T interval Uh, containing T naught. Over which, we're almost done, I promise, P of T and Q of T are continuous, and that's it. Now you can see why the existence and uniqueness theorem is such a bear to understand because even with me writing it down, it takes one whole board to even get the words down. And then you really struggle a lot of times with understanding what it's really saying. Now I've already given you the punchline. So I wanted to do that so that you know what it means so that as you read it, then you can read it with me and you'll understand how to read it and understand what it's trying to tell you. The punchline is differential equations have a solution. And if it's a well-behaved equation, it has one and only one solution that's unique. In other words, it doesn't have a million different solutions. Uh, and now, don't forget, we're talking about differential equations with an initial condition. Because don't forget, when we start with a regular world differential equation, we start integrating, we get that general solution that has a bunch of constants. That really is an infinite set of solutions, but as soon as you give it an initial condition, you find the answer to those constants, and that locks the solution into one and only one solution, because there are no more random constants left in your answer. So that's the difference between the general solution and the what we called the specific solution earlier. Now here, we're talking about solving a differential equation with an initial condition. Let's see where the theorem says that. Let's go ahead and start line by line. Suppose a first order differential equation, ODE, can be written as this. We talked about that. They usually all can. If they can't be written like that, it's not a linear equation and it's just much more complicated than what we're even talking about here. There exists a solution through an initial point, x of t naught is equal to alpha. This is where the theorem starts to trip people up because you start glossing over what are they talking about, x of t naught. This is just your initial condition. I mean, whenever we were solving all of those equations before, uh, I may have told you solve some differential equation, and your initial condition is uh, x at 0 is equal to 1. Or I may have said, okay, your initial condition is at x at time 0, uh, you know, time t equals 0 seconds, is equal to 5. This could be the initial position of a spring, or it could be the initial position of a ball, or something that's moving. It could be the initial temperature, if you're talking about a differential equation that has temperature. But that's the initial condition. So this is just a general way of writing the initial condition. At some time t naught, that's some initial time. It could be t is equal to zero usually, but if you're starting the clock at t is equal to one for some reason, then that would be your initial condition. The value of the, 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 the function x that we're trying to solve is equal to some number. They don't want to use another, usually they don't use another letter of the, of the alphabet, so they use a Greek letter alpha, but it, it could be anything in your book, and your, your book may actually have it written slightly different. But what it's saying is that there exists a solution through the initial point, this is what your initial condition is, so that means the solution of this guy exists um, going through that point um, if the two parts of this guy that we've sort of set up here are continuous um, at t naught, at this initial time. So that's really the constraint that actually comes into it. Like I said before, the differential equation has to be well behaved. What that means is that when you write it down, these functions here, once you put this guy into this form, this function of t and this function of t, they really need to be 
um, they really need to be smooth and continuous. So you can have sine of t here, you can have cosine of t here, you can have uh, you know something else. But what you you would never define a differential equation that would have a discontinuity there in t. Uh, you wouldn't have a discontinuous discon uh, jump there, for instance. And in practice, you're not going to see differential equations that really aren't well behaved, especially in a first semester differential equation course. And actually, even when you get out into the real world and start looking at real differential equations, I'm not going to sit here and say that you'll never come across a, a, a weird looking, oddly behaving differential equation. But most of the time, they, be, they obey this just fine. Even differential equations that, that talk about electricity and magnetism, differential equations that talk about heat transfer, they're usually going to end up involving smooth continuous functions because nature sort of by definition usually doesn't discontinually just jump around like instantaneously in time. Usually everything's nice and smoothly moving. So I'm not going to sit here and say you couldn't come across something, but by and large when you find a differential equation, it's going to satisfy this whole continuous thing at t naught. The differential equation, if it's following the laws of nature, is usually going to be continuous. So let's catch, up, catch ourselves up. There exists a solution through this initial condition. If these parts of the equation are continuous, usually they are, at the time zero that we're talking about. This solution is unique and it exists at, at least on the largest t interval containing t naught over which this guy is continuous. So that's just another mouthful and this is written in this way and uh, uh, your book may be written in another way. And your book may be written at a, in another way but basically what it's saying is that this part of the guy tells you that the solution exists. There exists a solution. This part of the guy is telling you that this solution is unique. In other words, there's only one of them. And it exists on the largest t interval over which uh, containing my initial condition over which these guys are continuous. So it's kind of just telling you already what we talked about before. It's like, look, here's a solution. It exists provided these guys are continuous. And furthermore, this solution is unique on some interval containing my initial condition, the largest t interval I can possibly find over which these guys are continuous. In other words, if I had a discontinuous jump, in, in part of in either in P or in Q, as long as my initial time that I was trying to find my solution for was in the continuous region where these functions were continuous, then I can find a solution in that region. Most of the time, P and Q, I'm not going to sit here and say forever and ever more, but most of the time P and Q are just continuous forever. Take, you know, if you put just T here, you know, T, let's, let's say T is here. T is continuous forever, minus infinity to infinity. T squared is continuous forever. Sine of T is continuous forever. Now most of the time P and Q are going to be continuous forever. I'm not going to sit here and say that you'll never come up with a situation where you'll have a discontinuous jump in, your, you know, in parts of your differential equation that make it weirdly and oddly behaving, but most of the time in the real world your differential equations will be well behaved and well bounded forever and ever um, most of the time, especially in the systems that you're going to study early on in, in your differential equations course. So if you take it into that context, all it's saying is that there exists a solution through this initial condition and this solution is unique over the largest interval I can find that these guys are continuous, which most of the time is negative infinity to positive infinity, so that means my solution is unique over this entire interval. All right, so that's basically what the existence and uniqueness theorem is. It's a lot of words. There's a million different ways to write it. When you get to higher order differential equations, you'll see it written again. It'll be stated slightly differently, but the intent is the same. Basically, if you have a, a differential equation and it's well behaved, it doesn't jump around everywhere, it's got nice, smooth, continuous parts to it, then you can find a single unique solution over some interval in time uh, where that differential equation is well behaved. And that's basically what it is. I'm Jason. I hope I've kind of illuminated a little bit about what this is talking about. A lot of times in math, uh, the, the proofs and the theorems can get really lengthy and you don't really know what it's trying to say because you're so busy trying to read it and just trying to decipher every word. What I wanted to do here is really let you understand what the existence and uniqueness theorem is because you'll talk about it, you'll probably have it on your test, but really it's just telling you, look, you've got a solution. Uh, go find it. Even if you don't know how to find it, it does exist. Uh, we kind of take that for granted now because we're taking these classes. We know these solutions exist. But it's basically telling you if you pull any old random differential equation off the street and it's well behaved like this, a solution will be uh, existing and uh, you'll be able to find it, uh, hopefully by closed form methods. But even if not, a solution exists, maybe even if you don't know how to find it, and that solution is unique. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.